Hi, Starklings. It's me. And I saved a baby once. So, what happened? Who was this baby? Why did it need saving? How did I get involved in this situation? All important questions. So, let's go back in time, shall we? I was just a mere young entity at the time. I must have been around... Ooh... I must have been around... I was young, I was a child, or at least a preteen. I must have been around 11 or 12 years old when this all took place. So take that in mind when you hear this story, that I was around 11 or 12 years old. Yes, this story takes place in the past, not the present or the future, the past. But I think it's always important to look back on our own past, because if we ignore our histories, we are bound, and yes, we will repeat our own mistakes and our own victories, perhaps, because in this situation, I saved a baby one time. I was 12, let's say 12. I could have been 11, I could have been 13, but let's just say I was a 12-year-old child, and I was coming back home from the art store with my father. We were both war Walking back home from town, yes, I was at the art store, a very important place to me as a child and still an important place to me now as an adult because, of course, I am an artist and an artist is always in need of their supplies. And of course, you have to go to an art store. I'm not... I, I well, When I was a child, I wasn't fancy enough to make my own arts and craft materials. Now, as an adult, I can easily do that. But as a child, I was in... I wasn't ready to do that. I didn't have the experience, I didn't have the know-how, and I didn't have the money. But that 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 that's far from the point of this story. This story is about how I... I saved a baby one time. As I was saying, I was walking back home with my father from the art store. I had my new paints and supply. I had a new shade of blue that I was really keen on trying out. I just wanted to get home straight away, open up this paint and just put it on the canvas and see how that blue would look. See how it would make me feel. But... I had to wait. I had to wait and be patient as we went back home. So we toddled off back home, chatting about how this blue would look, what we thought it would look like on the canvas. And before we knew it, our journey was put on a sudden stop when a woman came running up to us, her face red, covered with tears, drenched in her own tears. This woman was crying, she was screaming, she was saying words that I could not understand because of her accent, and that is not me being, me being funny, or me being judgmental. She had a thick Australian accent, which, yes, as a fellow Australian, I understand our own accent, but sometimes it is even too thick for me to understand, and that's saying a lot. So this woman came running up to us, screaming something incomprehensible because of her accent, and please do not judge her for this accent. Please do not judge her for not being able to be understood by others because of where she grew up, and where she was raised, and with what accent she she was raised with. That is not the point of this story. This is not a story about judgment. This is a story about revelation and redemption. But now that we got all the judgments out of the way, this woman came running up to us saying that she's locked her child alone inside of her own house. So again, please do not judge this woman for leaving her child alone in the house and locked inside, okay? No judgments on the accent, no judgment on the actions of the woman. Okay, we've all made mistakes, we've all had errors, we've all had lapses of judgment before. But do not make a lapse of your own by listening to this story and walking away with a harsh critique of a woman you have not even met. That isn't right. I say, don't judge a book by its cover, judge it by its contents. My father grabbed this woman gently by the shoulders and said to her, What are you saying? What is this about a baby that's been locked inside all alone? 
we had to take a moment to sit the woman down, make her do some deep, heavy breathing, one breath in, one breath out, to calm her down, to calm her down so that she could talk to us. Yes, she managed to stop crying. Yes, she managed to tell us the information. It took a little while to decipher again because of her thick Australian accent, which was hard to understand. Yes, she was clearly what we would call a bogan, but that is a derogatory term. She is a lower class person, and her accent, yes, reflected that information as well as her appearance. She was wearing flannel after all. But let's not... Look down upon her because of her status in life. This woman locked a baby inside of her own house, accidentally, as we found out. She was just walking outside to check her mail, and the door closed behind her, and it was locked. She couldn't get in. She walked out to the streets. No one was around because it was a Saturday afternoon in a small rural town, so everyone was down at the pub. But... That did not deter her from walking around downtown to find somebody, anybody, and thankfully she found us. My father and a 12-year-old me. Yes, let's say 12. We walked back with her to her home. It was quite a while away from our own house, so I'm not proud to say, but I was a little bit annoyed. I was being a selfish, arrogant child. I just wanted to go back home and paint. I did not care about this woman and her baby. I couldn't give a rat's about her child because I was ignorant. You've got to remember that I was just a small child at the time. I had just come back from the art store in which we had spent a couple of hours determining which shade of blue we were going to buy and take back home. So my anticipation was highly built up for this shade of blue to put on the canvas. And now I had to wait. I had to wait because of a woman that I do not know. And she's wearing flannel and she's crying and she's locked a baby inside. I have to wait to get my shade of blue on the canvas for this woman to help this woman that's how arrogant i was that was the thought process going on in my brain i did not recognize the seriousness of the situation because of course it's a serious situation imagine if you were the baby locked inside you would be terrified you would be afraid you wouldn't know what to feel or think you'd be hungry you'd be it's unimaginable to be that child It is unimaginable, unless you're the child who is now watching this video and you have memories that go back that far and you can remember this situation in which I came in and saved you from being locked inside all alone by your mother, then you understand this situation. But it, other other than that, other than you being this individual person, this is an unimaginable situation. And me as a preteen child could not put myself in that situation. I could not put myself in that position, and I did not have the empathy. We are all needing to discover our empathy even more than what we currently do. We can always evolve ourselves. We can always adapt and change and grow, and finding more empathy is a great way of doing that, and I was on my journey to do that. So, we eventually got back to this woman's house, and I know I said not to judge, but the appearance of the property was... It wasn't art, to say the least. The fence was rusted, some of it had collapsed and fallen down, the mailbox was on a skew, which... You know, in the modern age, uh, a mailbox that is slightly on an angle is actually quite trendy. But back then, that was not the aesthetic of the status quo. We looked at that and said... There's been trouble here. There's been a lot of trouble in this household. We walked up to the front yard. We had to wade our way through the lawn because it had not been mowed in quite a few weeks. We got through the yard 
the jungle that it was, we hacked our way through it, we got onto the front porch, and we tried to open the front door. Of course, it was locked. We did not think it wouldn't be. The woman's words seemed honest, even though we could barely understand it. We we tried. My father gave a light kick to the door, because it looked a little bit flimsy, but it wouldn't budge. So my father gave a hard kick to the door. Still wouldn't budge. My father then tried to shoulder barge the door. I stopped him because I had a realization. I had a thought. I said, Daddy, what happened if we went to the backyard and saw if one of the doors or windows are open back there? My father gave me that look. That look of my child is a genius. He he gave me that look. You don't get that look all the time. But when a parent or parental unit gives you that look of recognition of your talents, of your genius. You treasure that. You keep it in your heart. My father said, Stark, go out back, check the doors, check the windows. I'll stay here with the mother and give her words of reassurance. So I did just that. I scaled my way through the jungle that was around her house that was the unmowed lawn. You mow your lawns, people. You do not know what kind of creatures lurk in there. I live in Australia. There could have been a snake in that yard. I could have been bitten by a snake on my way to save this child. That's where the dangers were in this situation. I could have been bitten and poisoned by a snake. The venom could have entered my veins, and I may not have been here right now to tell you this story. I could have died because of this yard being not mowed. So remember, mow your lawns. Because if there's ever a situation that people enter into, that they need to go into your yard and it hasn't been mowed, someone could get hurt. A child like me, at that time, could have gotten hurt. Thankfully, I survived. I got into the backyard but the door was still locked. The back door was locked. I tried to give it a little kick, but I'm not as strong as my father at that time. I'm stronger than him now, but I wasn't stronger than him then. I looked around and I couldn't see anything to help me. Then I had a realization. What about a window? So I tried to to, to claw at all these windows, and wouldn't you know it, one of them was open. It was one up high for the bathroom. It was an up high window. It was... The window must have been at least a couple of feet in the air, quite a bit taller than myself, and I was a tall child at this age, and I'm even taller now. So you can imagine the predicament I was in. I could not get into this window. I needed assistance. So what do I do? I do what any child does. I called out for my daddy. I said, Daddy, Daddy, please come out back. I need your help. And he did. He walked through that yard. Again, the dangers were high, but he managed to make it. He walked in. He looked at me and he said, Yes, Stark, what do you need help with? I pointed at the window. I said, look up there, that window. It's open. I could get through that window. I'm small enough. I'm small enough. If I was small enough to fit through that window, that must have meant that I was younger. Younger than 12. Because if I was 12... And I would have been too long and big to fit in that window. So scrap that. I wasn't 12 years old. I must have been at least seven. So I was at least seven years old. Let's say seven. And I said to him, I said to my father, how about you put me on your shoulders and push me through this window and I'll safely land on whatever's inside. (laughs) Knowing this woman, her yard has cracked through the floor and I'll just land in another jungle. (laughs) My father especially at that time, had very strong, broad shoulders. So I was able to perfectly fit on top of them. He hoisted me up. 
I grabbed onto the windowsill. It was filthy. It clearly has not been cleaned or dusted in quite some time, which is, again, understandable. It's very, very high up, but my hands were covered in filth. So I had to crawl my way up. And I managed to wiggle my way through. Uh, my shirt was filthy after this, which... Again, as a child at the time, I was arrogant, I was selfish, I was angry. My nice shirt has now been ruined by some unknown filth. I would be okay with it. I would have been okay with it if it was my own filth, if it was my paints or stuff like that. But this was unknown filth. So I was very annoyed at this at the time. So <laughs> you can understand where I'm coming from, of course. It's it's somebody else's filth and you're covered in it. Ugh. But I kept having to say to myself, I'm doing this to save a baby. I'm doing this to save a baby. I'm doing this to save a baby and so that it's done I can go back home and use my blue paint that's where my thought process was at yes I was young yes I was selfish but I had not yet had the revelation and realization and redemption that is going to be coming at the end of the story I jumped down from the windowsill and I landed on top of the sink I was in the bathroom I gave a quick surveil around and I couldn't see the baby in there so the baby was not in the bathroom thankfully imagine if it had crawled in there and it was eating something that it shouldn't now that could have been dangerous but thankfully the baby wasn't in the bathroom so I hopped down off the sink and I exited the bathroom. I walked down the hallway and there I was before I knew it in their lounge room. The lounge room, of course, was covered in baby paraphernalia. There was a little playpen there for it. There was toys everywhere, everywhere. And this smell. <sighs> That's one of the things that I, that turns me off having a child. The smell. That they make or oh, smells many of them and all of them unpleasant i was looking around i could not see this baby i looked under the couch wasn't there i looked in the kitchen wasn't there i heard knocking at the door knock 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 of course i replied with who is it because i am being polite i'm in somebody else's house i don't just answer any old door for any old one i need to know who it is of course <laughs> Silly, silly, silly. It was the woman. She was knocking on the door saying, let me in so I can get the baby. Let me in. Let me in. <laughs> I didn't even think about opening the door, unlocking the door for the woman to get her own baby. I was just so caught up in the moment that I thought that I could just walk in there and find the baby on my own. And so... <sighs> egg all over my face i opened the door and the woman went running in went straight into the baby's bedroom which i hadn't even noticed apparently i had walked straight past it it was just completely completely in my blind spot she walked in looked at the baby and the baby was still asleep there was the baby in its crypt still asleep at that's just amazing. This whole entire time, we had built a narrative in our own brain that the baby was crawling around, eating stuff, getting electrocuted. You know, we were imagining that the baby was in death peril, but it wasn't. The baby was completely fine. It was asleep, enjoying its rest, enjoying its nap, and we did not want to wake the child. Of course, I said check the child's pulse in case of anything, just make sure it's breathing, and of course, the the mother said, of course it's breathing. I can see that my baby is breathing stark. And uh, uh, that's how I saved a baby. And I looked at that baby sleeping there, being so small, being so innocent. It didn't even know that it was in danger at any point. And isn't that kind of like life? We're in danger all the time. Look at the world around us right now. It's a constant source of danger on a global scale. But we go on. We persevere. We live in, in a way, we live in a bubble. We get up in the morning and 
We could die, but we still get up and we still persevere and we still make progress and we still interact and we still do the stuff that makes us alive, even though the end could come. Because that is a part of the human condition. That is a part of perseverance. And I saw that child there and I realized how selfish I've been. How ignorant I've been. I had the revelation that I've been setting up from the beginning of this story. I had that revelation that I had to stop being inherently a selfish person. And then I redeemed myself. Because when I went back home, I didn't open up that blue paint. I waited to do it until the next day. For you see, I withheld the thing that I thought that I needed, the thing that I wanted. I withheld it from myself. I said, no, you have not earned this blue paint. Yes, you've spent money on it, but you have not earned it. You need to wait. You need to really think about what it is to be a human. What it is to be a fluid artist in a concrete world. As I laid in bed that night, I felt like a baby, small, innocent and helpless, yet completely oblivious and unaware of the world around me. It was a sublime feeling, a feeling that I haven't had since, well, since I was a baby myself. <sighs> this experience of saving a baby really changed my viewpoints on the world. And I hope that me telling you this story has changed your views on the world, has changed you as a person, and has made you see me in a different light. That's the story about how I saved a baby, guys. So if you enjoyed this story, make sure to leave a like, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell as well, and make sure to leave a comment below. Have you ever saved a baby? Have you ever done anything heroic? What is it to be a hero? When you do something heroic, do you feel anything? Do you recognize that you've done something good? Or is it just natural impulses? Let me know. Till then, guys, remember to think of others.